How is everything tasting? Oh, this is this is great chicken. That's not chicken. Are you sure? Tastes like chicken to me. <laughs> I assure you. Oh no. Oh, what have I done? internet welcome to food theory the only show that won't chicken out when it comes to meaty mysteries we've all heard it before this tastes like chicken that tastes like chicken heck at this point i'm probably sure my own foot would taste like chicken if only i could cook it properly it's a phrase that's managed to permeate every corner of media they really do taste like chicken when prepared properly it's a chicken tastes like chicken except for uh, this guy in hell's kitchen apparently tastes like a um, meat tortellini with a Bit of sweated onions in the background. Oh, I love that clip. Anyway, the phrase that tastes like chicken is so common at this point, I kind of feel bad even doing an episode on the topic, but my intellectual curiosity has no shame. Why does everyone insist that everything tastes like chicken? At first, I was just curious about where the phrase started. It's like a meme that existed before there were even memes. Well, it turns out that the same guy who mistook North America for India might have also been responsible for mistaking pork chops for drumsticks. That's right, it's none other than everyone's favorite geographically challenged explorer, Christopher Columbus. Rumor has it that he once used the phrase to describe the taste of iguana, which is commonly found all over the Caribbean where he landed, and coincidentally also appeared in more pictures than I did in my recent vacation to Mexico. I guess that means Columbus didn't care for him too much because their descendants are seriously thriving. Since then, fictional foods such as the grub from the Matrix, Fallout's iguana on a stick, and the regular show's every meat burrito are among the fraction of the items that have been bestowed this culinary honor. Of course, that fact alone is enough to ruffle my theorist feathers. All of those are vastly different dishes, but they all somehow share a common taste? That's a red flag right there. Just how is that even possible? Is it possible? Is it all just in our heads, or is there some actual science to the idea that tons of other things actually taste like chicken? Instead of letting this pop culture urban legend peck away at my sanity, I want to figure this out. And to start, I need to break down just how chicken gets its taste, and why that taste is so universal. First, what are we actually eating when we're eating chicken? Well, meat is any flesh or animal part that we consume, but in the US, we primarily think of meat as the muscle tissue of an animal. That drumstick is basically your calf muscle. The wing that's a nice mouthful of bicep. Just like different muscles in your body are used differently though, different animal muscles develop different textures because of where they are in the body and how they're used. This means that when it comes to taste, how you handle your meat matters. Probably should have rephrased that one. Nope, it's recorded, let's move on. And it's not just about where your meat comes from, but the taste of the meat can also be impacted by a huge range of other factors, including what the animal ate before landing on your plate, how it was aged, and even the temperature that was cooked at. Starting with cut. When you enjoy your winner winner chicken dinners, you'll have four main options to choose from. Breast meat, wings, thighs, and legs, with thighs and legs considered to be dark meat. Dark meat is, as the name suggests, darker than white meat, and it carries that slightly reddish or pinkish color even when it's been thoroughly cooked. This is thanks to a high concentration of myoglobin, an oxygen-carrying protein that's responsible for providing muscles with the oxygen required for exercise and movement. Since chickens have found themselves on nature's no-fly list, every day for these little suckers is leg day, meaning that more myoglobin is going to be present in their legs than anywhere else in their body. On the other hand, both the wings and the breasts are what we consider to be white meat. White meat is generally lighter in color, it's leaner in fat, and as a result it dries out more easily when it's cooked. This is traditionally the cut of chicken that we associate with that chickeny taste, whatever that means, because there's no extra myoglobin in that area to give it an irony flavor. But you can't talk about flavor without also talking about smell. Have you ever heard of something being aromatic? Most of us just think of this as something that smells good, or just has a strong smell, but actually it means that it contains molecules that belong to a specific group, the aromatic group. Hence the name. These molecules have specific structures that interact with your little nose buds to produce a smell. So the more of these that are swimming around in a meat, the more likely that meat is going to have itself a specific taste. There are aromatics present in almost all the food that we eat, but the different profiles of those molecules make us taste and smell different things when we eat them. In 2013, the Asian Journal of Animal Science produced one of the first papers to summarize a lot of the aromatic compounds that go into chicken, but you can see that they contribute lots of different flavors, all in different ratios. All the gobbledygook molecules on the left Left, translate into all kinds of different flavors on the right, from your traditional flavors like meaty and fatty to a few others that you wouldn't really see coming, violet-like, sulfurous, or my favorite, roasty, which makes me think that we covered the chicken with a lot of marshmallow. Different meats and different cuts of the same meat will have vastly different ratios of these aromatics, which cause us to experience different flavors. Many of these molecules are released or break down when combined with heat, meaning that most of them aren't reaching your nose or mouth until the meat is cooked. That means that we're not just looking at what's inside a raw chicken, we need to understand 
understand what's happening when you slap that breast on the grill or in a pan. So what's actually going on in that broiler of yours to make chicken go from this gross floppy jellyfish to a five-star dinner? Well, there are two major chemical reactions that are releasing most of the flavors that you taste when you bite into chicken. One is called lipid oxidation, and the other is called the Maillard reaction, which means it's time to roll up your sleeves because those are some big old sciency looking words. If these sound complicated, you're not that wrong. These are reactions that you wouldn't typically study unless you're taking some pretty serious college chemistry classes, but we only need to know a few things about them, so don't faint away just yet. And best of all, once you learn these, you'll know a whole lot about everything you cook because these reactions don't just happen in chicken. They happen in almost every kind of meat you eat, even in non-meat food. Just think of how smart you're going to look at Uncle Ron's next backyard barbecue when you start breaking out the Maillard reaction facts. If that's not a reason to subscribe, I don't know what is. Impress your Uncle Ron, hit the subscribe button. We're starting off easy with lipid oxidation, which is pretty straightforward. What's another word for lipid? Fat. What's oxidation? Literally just adding oxygen to something. So what is lipid oxidation? It is adding oxygen and fat together. Look, chemistry is so easy. When you add oxygen to fats and fatty acids in meat, it breaks down the fatty acid chains and changes their structure. This also happens when meat spoils, and that's not so pretty, but when it happens because you've added heat, the meat cooks and the structural phospholipids, just a fancy way of saying the fat in the chicken, break down and release little aromatic molecules called aldehydes that fly all over the place, bumping into other molecules in the chicken. Those aldehydes then go on to take a major starring role in part two of our epic chicken cooking adventure, the Maillard reaction. You might have heard this term tossed around a lot. It's like a culinary name drop these days. And it's associated with lots of cooking techniques, like caramelization of meat, the part of cooking that makes stuff crispy and brown on the outside. Well, chefs certainly toss this name around a lot, most of them are probably only doing it because they heard Alton Brown mention it one time on an episode of Good Eats. I can say with a fair amount of certainty that most chefs don't fully understand what they're talking about. Yep, I said that. It is a bold claim coming from a random guy on the internet who eats most of his meals at McDonald's. I recognize that fact. But the truth is that the Maillard reaction is a series of reactions that's so complex that even scientists are still trying to wrap their head around what's really going on with this thing. What we do know, though, is that these reactions happen when amino acids and sugars present in our food are transformed by heat. Normally between 230 and 340 degrees Fahrenheit, or 110 to 171 C. This results in mouth-watering new flavors and aromas. These are where we get the slightly sweet notes that sometimes appear in cooking, especially when we've seared a great steak or have gotten a great piece of chicken off the grill. That roasty taste is commonly associated with the Maillard reaction, and texturally we can usually tell that the meat is a little charred or has a nice crisp on the outside. Since the temperature for triggering the Maillard reaction is so high, you'll notice that it takes place more often when you're doing things like barbecuing, roasting, or even frying. And it's almost impossible to achieve with something like boiling. And even though we're talking about chicken right now, you'll see it all over the place once you know where to look. Did you have a cup of coffee this morning? Or maybe you ate a piece of toast? Both of these are the result of the Maillard reaction. It's responsible for the nutty, roasted flavor of coffee, and also for giving toast its slight hint of caramel. But when it comes to chicken, you can't stop there. We have one last step in creating the perfect chicken flavor profile. You see, chicken is a special animal. Not literally, these guys are just fluffy dinosaurs. They are totally insane and everywhere. But their meat gets very special when you combine the Maillard reaction with the lipid oxidation that we talked about before. Turns out when their powers combine, or when the byproducts of the two reactions get together, we're left with one molecule that directly accounts for everything that we call chicken signature flavor. Welcome the flavor of chicken, 2-methyl-3-furanthiol. Yep, this. This keyboard mash of a word right here, this is the flavor that we're referring to when we say it tastes like chicken. And it's usually referred to as 2-MF. This is called a landmarked flavor. A flavor that's extremely recognizable, present in a high ratio in chicken. And it's become a trendsetter for the food world as we know it. Studies have found that this compound gives off a media aroma, and that 2-MF is not only found in chicken, it's in lots of other meats as well. And here, my friends, is where our mystery all starts coming together. According to Joe Staten from the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, other bird meat like pigeon, goose, and even quail tend to have chicken-like flavors, which is going to be expected because chemically they're undergoing the same two chemical reactions and producing our buddy 2-MF. What's less expected, though, is that exotic meats like bullfrog, kangaroo, alligator, and even iguanas all have themselves a chicken-like taste. Not because we have bad taste buds, but because of a long, long shared ancestry. Remember how I offhandedly mentioned a little while ago that chickens are just crazy little dinosaurs? Or that if you're eating dino nuggets, you're not really eating dinos? Well, I might have put those in there as a bit of a hint. Basically, if you go back far enough, chickens are dinosaurs. Or at least they're in the ballpark. Chickens, and all birds for that matter, belong to a very wide range of animals called theropods, who all have three toes and hollow bones. But it turns out that other animals we sometimes eat also date back pretty far. Iguanas? You kidding me? Look at these guys. They have dinosaur written all over them. Bullfrogs? Alligators? Lots of members of the reptile and lizard families? All of them stem from a very long ago adjacent branch of the evolutionary tree to some of our 
modern day birds at the same building blocks inside their muscles today. Branching out past all the amphibians that you're obviously cooking on an everyday basis, all those turtles, lizards, and frogs that you're frying up on the average Tuesday, you also have a similar effect with many kinds of fish and pork. A lot of cuts of pork have a similar fat profile as chicken, leaner, lower in cholesterol, and essentially undergoing the same two reactions to produce the same 2MF compound when you cook them. The cuts of pork that don't have this profile and are much fattier, like bacon, they have themselves a different flavor profile. That's because the ratio of fat to lean meat is so much higher in these cuts that 2MF is no longer the only strong flavor influence. That's why we don't say that bacon tastes like chicken. Once 2MF has competition, we immediately lose that chickeny flavor profile. Same goes with most cuts of beef, where that same lipid oxidation and Maillard reaction are absolutely taking place, but we don't say that beef tastes like chicken because there are other flavors out competing 2MF. Iron, fat, other aromatics related to 2MF, but just different enough to produce different flavors. All of them are mixing together in a completely different ratio, giving you more of that umami flavor rather than the mild meatiness of chicken. So it turns out that the incredibly overused trope of it tastes like chicken isn't as crazy and overused as we think it is. It's just that when it comes to meats of the world, a lot of things do taste like chicken, and it all boils down to two things. The muscles that animals have last through a lot, and I mean a lot of generations of evolution, so much so that if any part of your evolutionary past once crossed with a chicken, chances are you got meat that tastes pretty similar. The other thing we've established is that our perception of flavor comes down to a remarkably small number of compounds. At most, the list is like 20 molecules long for meat, but at the end of the day, just two or three landmark compounds contribute a huge amount of the flavor that we associate with our food. So when it comes to tricking our tongue into thinking that we're eating chicken, it's not nearly as hard of a job as you might think. Now, I'm not saying that you should just go out there and test the limits of this. Please leave the toads and iguanas in your local area alone. But the next time you have the chance to try something exotic like an alligator nugget at the fair, or heck, your grandma's famous pork chop recipe, might as well go for it. You know exactly what you're tasting, right down to the molecule. But hey, that's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. And hey, if you want to impress Uncle Ron even more at the next Backyard Barbecue, click the video on the left, where we decide what is better, a gas grill or a charcoal grill. We're taking a controversial topic and attacking it with science. Or if you want to learn how to properly stack that burger once it's off the grill, that one's over on the right. Get ready for your summer barbecues, my friends. Your Uncle Ron will thank you.